Welcome back. This is the last part of our Getting Started series. In this video, we are going to cover the information you need to know before you can publish your skill to the world. We start on the Distribution tab. And here, you can see that we start with a public name. This is the name we expect our users to find our skill when they're looking in the store or anywhere else. This doesn't have to match the invocation name that we created, but I highly recommend it because it reinforces the name that they'll use when they try to talk to your software. For our descriptions, we have a sample short description and a sample full description. These are your opportunities to provide information to your users about what your skill does. This should be completely accurate. It shouldn't mislead them or give them ideas about things that don't actually happen inside your skill, but it should give them a really good understanding about what it's supposed to do once they get inside. We also have a what's new box for future publications when you want to let people know about release notes or new updates you've added to your skill. The example phrases are a very important piece of all of this. In the store, you will actually see that each skill has their own example phrases highlighted right there on the page. And so these example phrases, not only do they have to work exactly as you expect them to in your skill, they have to work verbatim. So there has to be a sample utterance in one of your intents somewhere in your interaction model that exactly matches the things that you're going to have here. So we wouldn't want someone to say open hello world, but we might say open car shopper. And for our other two, we could just say something like um, Jeep Wrangler and something simple like Ford. Um, this lets them know that there are different ways that they can interact with the skill. And I know that the sample utterances that we created earlier can handle all of these three situations. It's really, really important. You will not pass certification if these don't match your sample utterances exactly. The rest of this is a bunch of metadata that we want to focus on. What category does our information go into? For our case, this is a reference skill. We're looking up the prices of cars. So I'm going to put it in the education and reference category, but there are lots and lots of different categories for you to choose from to make sure your skill is found in the right place that people are looking. We also have keywords. This is a great way for us to come in and add specific values that you may not have had in your descriptions or in your titles. For example, we've called this car shopper, but we haven't ever said the word automobile. So maybe we want to include automobile or auto or car shopping. Uh, just as a couple of other words that people might search for as they're looking for a skill like ours. We also have the opportunity to provide a privacy policy URL and a terms of use URL. If you're collecting any kind of personal information about your users, you're going to need to provide both of these to indicate not only what you're doing with the data, but how you're going to use it as well. Finally, down here at the bottom, we have the media details. This includes things like icons and page videos and images. You'll notice in very small link down here at the bottom that says click here to use the Alexa icon builder. If I do click on that, you'll actually see that we have this really nice tool for all of us, if you're anything like me, that aren't great at creating our own icons. There's lots and lots of things that we can choose in here, and I can say car, for example, and find car icons. And once I found one like this, actually looks like a pretty good icon. So I could download this, and then I could use those files and upload them into the console as we see here. To save some time, we'll skip past that, but you can upload videos and images that'll be shown in line in your store listing as well. On the next screen, we are gonna be asked a few questions about privacy and compliance. So the first one is, does the skill allow users to make purchases or spend real money? Well, the features we've built so far, the answer is definitely no. Does this skill use Alexa shopping actions? This is a cool feature that I can tell you about briefly. It allows you to sell products that are sold directly on amazon.com. Users can come in, they can talk to your skill, you can offer them a product, and as a result, they will have it shipped to them and charged to the card that they use on Amazon.com regularly. In addition to this, if you sign up for Amazon Associates, you can also get a small commission off of each of the sales that you make as a result of shopping actions. Now, we're not using it in this skill, but we certainly could, so I'm going to leave my answer as no. Does this collect any personal information about my users? Answer is also no. Is this skill directed to, or does it target children under the age of 13? This is an important distinction to make. If your skill is only for people under the age of 13, then it's probably something that you need to say yes to. But if it's something that lots and lots of people would use, including people under 13, it's probably a no. It's only when you're thinking about content and experiences that are designated specifically for people under 13. Finally, does your skill contain any advertising? The answer for this one also happens to be no. 
we check a box to say it's okay to export our software uh, outside the United States or wherever country or region you live in. And finally, we have testing instructions. This is another very important box for our entire process. This allows us to communicate directly with the humans that are going to be testing our skill before it's certified and published. We want to give them specific instructions on how to use our skill and what to expect and where they can find all of the functionality inside your skill. This also includes things like account linking. If you have to create an account on a separate website, you might want to provide them with testing credentials here so that they don't have to go through that entire process. So those are our testing instructions. The last step here is availability. There's a very important tool here called beta testing, which allows us to roll our skill out to a bunch of users before our skill has been published. This is a great way to get your friends and family or your colleagues and teammates to be able to test the software before it's been released to the public. In addition, we can also allow it to be automated to distribute across many locales. So if you built in US English, you can check this box and it'll be distributed across all of the different English locales without any extra effort on your part. You can also use this list down here at the bottom to choose specific countries or regions that you want your skill to be distributed in. So if you only want it available in a few countries, you can narrow that down with this list. Our last step in the certification tab is to make sure that we are validating our skill against all of the automated tests that are available. You'll see that I've already failed a few of them and that's fine. We haven't actually gone through the entire process yet. But this is a warning that all of these automated tests will be run at certification and it's an opportunity for us to recognize and fix any of the issues that may exist before we actually push our skill to certification. Once we've passed all these validation tests though, we can go to the submission tab and this will give us the opportunity to submit our skill for review. This is where your skill goes into a window where it's being reviewed by a team of people, uh, as well as a bunch of automated tests to make sure that you are checking all the boxes that we've seen in the certification guidelines. Uh, if you haven't had an opportunity yet to go through the certification guidelines, I highly recommend it. It is a very specific list of the things you are and aren't allowed to do, uh, and these tests and these humans are going to be the ones to make sure that that actually happens. Okay, so let's move on. Let's pretend that we've gotten our skill past all those tests and through the certification process. How's our skill doing? How's it performing? Well, that's the last tab here, analytics. And as we look at our analytics tab, you can see that there's all sorts of opportunities to see what's going on with our skill. Not just our customers or our utterances or any of the other things that happen inside our skill, including intents and retention or how people are using our skill, but there's one important feature that I want to make sure that you see, and that's the skill quality coach. Now, there isn't any data here for this skill because we just built it, but as you build a skill and as you roll it out to users, the skill quality coach will actually analyze and look at your skill and give you recommendations on ways to improve your skill. It'll give you specific tips and ideas on things you can do to make changes to your skill to make it of a higher quality. And the way we measure that quality is through something called the skill quality score. This is a number that ranges from zero to five, and it gives you an indication of how high quality your skill happens to be. Now you can have a really amazing experience that's very simple with bare bones features that doesn't have the highest quality score. But as you think about these recommendations, I think you'll find based on our experience looking at hundreds of thousands of skills that it will improve the experience for your users. It will eventually attract new users to your skill uh, and overall it'll create a better experience for everyone. Spend a little time looking at the skill quality coach, look at the recommendations that are offered and think about how you can incorporate those into your future releases. Now that we've published our skill, the journey has just begun. There's so much more we can do beyond just creating a voice interaction. One, we could start with APL. APL, or Alexa Presentation Language, is a visual way to provide information on devices with screens like this one. We actually have a course in our Alexa Learning Lab that talks all about APL and helps you get started with that technology. The second thing I'd recommend looking into is the Alexa Routines Kit. You might see it abbreviated as ARK or ARC. It's a way for you to create routines in a user's account that include your skill as part of that experience. So they may have something that turns the lights off and also plays some sleepy time music from your skill. Uh, there's lots and lots of ways to play with the routines kit and I can't recommend it enough because it's a great way to get users to remember and make your skill an active part of their everyday. Finally, I wanna make sure we talk about monetization. Now there's lots of ways to do monetization. We talked about the shopping kit earlier. But specifically, I want to talk about in-skill purchasing, or ISPs. There's three different varieties that you can offer. You can offer subscriptions, you can offer a one-time purchase, and you can offer consumables. 
Subscriptions are pretty obvious. We all probably have some subscriptions these days. But a one-time purchase, imagine having an adventure game where you're out fighting an ogre and you need a very specific axe to defeat him. Well, you might have a one-time purchase that's in your game that allows the user to buy an axe that can get them past that ogre. It never goes away. They never lose it. They'll always have it in their inventory. Consumables, on the other hand, are the opposite of that. Consumables might be hints or clues or coins or something like that inside your game that a user buys some of them, they use them up, and then they have to buy some more. This is a great way to have some recurring revenue as users engage with your game and find more fun, fun ways to play it. Now is the time to get started building one of the many ideas floating around in your head. As you start building, you may find that there are features that you really wish existed. Our user voice website allows you to submit new feature ideas and vote up ideas that others have provided. This gives our product team the insight to plan their future development roadmaps. Finally, and I can't emphasize this enough, make sure to join our Slack community. You'll find some of the most helpful skill developers there, and we're all willing to answer your questions as you're getting started. If you really get stuck, there's also our Contact Us form, which sends a message to our Alexa developer advocacy team to get you the support you need. I want to thank you for watching. I'm really excited for the journey you're about to go on. I can't wait to talk to your skill. Oh,